morning. So hello everyone. My name is Brian Waters and I'm account executive here at Bales and Associates. And before we get started, if you're not familiar with Bales, I'd like to take a second to tell you a little about us. We have been in the N4 ecosystem for over 26 years. We're entirely, entirely N4 focused. We do nothing but N4 implementations, upgrades, and managed services. We support all aspects of the technology, including S3, Landmark, and Cloud Suite, including HCM, FM, finance, and supply chain. In fact, we have been recognized and given partnering awards in eight of the last 10 years. Our consultants bring 15 plus years of consulting experience in this space and the equivalent in professional experience. Some were former benefit managers, compensation managers, directors of supply chain, as well as former controllers and CFOs. Uh, exciting news for the N4 community. Earlier this year, Bales became part of Nordic, an industry leading healthcare consulting firm. We'll operate as a wholly owned subsidiary and continue to be led by Jamie Bales. Nordic will provide us with resources to fund our growth, expand our business, and export our customers more effectively. For healthcare customers, it allows us to bring together the Nordic's capabilities in the EHR space to provide a more holistic solution, including specific expertise in EHR and ERP integration. This combination will offer a best practice model to reduce implementation's risk in leveraging the data from both systems to drive insights and outcomes. Again, I'd like to thank you for joining us today, and let me introduce your presenter, John Quinn. John, it's all you. Okay, so I am John Quinn, and my official title these days is project manager. But um, I'm also a functional consultant, but I'm also a technical consultant. I often joke I am the product of not knowing what you want to be when you grow up because I have a very diverse background. I've worked in microbiology as a medical technician. I've worked as a patient registration supervisor. I am. Um, I used to be a German professor teaching German at the college level. I mean, I really had a hard time deciding what I wanted to be, but. I figured it out, and for the last um, the last 25 years, I have been in the human resources and payroll um, uh, space. Um, that is where my primary focus is. So, if you see me focusing on HR screens and your and your uh, financial and supply chain chain management person, uh, I just want to reassure you that while I am focusing on that, that just happens to be my background. Um, the types of things that I'm showing you today from a configuration console. Um, piece um, is uh, just as applicable on your side as it is on the HCM side uh, within the landmark environment, right? Um, so what we will be talking about today is the configuration console utility, and we'll be talking about the old rich client versus the new web UI. Uh, web UI. Um, many of you may know or have seen or heard or the way that thing turns through the uh, N4 world is that, that they were going to uh, deprecate or retire the rich client. And there were a few pieces that they were waiting for. Um, and so we wanna talk about uh, a couple of those pieces would be the new payroll module. The new payroll module, it's been released. It's been a year, it's been out on the market now for over a year. Um, clients are up and running on that. And then the other pieces that they needed to port over are some behind the scenes technical pieces. Um, and I'm going to be talking about those behind the scenes technical pieces today. And so um, we need to start having a conversation within the N4 community about uh, the deprecation of the rich client and moving to the new tools. So we will be talking about the configuration console utility tool. Alongside of that, we are going to be talking about the landmark pattern language LPL. Um, that is a it's based off it's based off of Java Beans if you are a programmer. Um, and basically, what it what the what it allows a, a company or organizational organization to do is to take Java and then write their own, let's say, flavor of Java and uh, come up with a new language in itself. It's like a, it's like rewriting a language within a language, right? And that is the landmark pattern language. Um, and I, I will need to focus on that uh, piece and that topic today as we talk about the new web UI and it will become very clear. Um, those of you who are interested in um, using the new web UI configuration console utility to make changes in the application, you are going to need to listen to what I have to say about landmark pattern language, the LPL. And then we're going to talk about web services and REST calls. Um, uh, 
some pe- a lot of people have been asking about reports as a service, meaning that I can set up a report inside of the system and that I can feed that like an RSS feed or I can re- I can feed that downstream uh, to a third party application or to a third party consumer. Um, that is something that is delivered and very easy s- to set up within the application. So we're going to be talking about web services and rest calls uh, toward the end of the call. So um, I have, I am supported today by Elizabeth Wilkerson or Liz Wilkerson. She's going to be monitoring the chat window um, and she is going to be, I'm going to be moving fast because there's a lot of information. Um, So just throw that, that question out there in the chat window and Liz will just chime in or she'll tell me to slow down. She's going to be keeping the time. She's going to be keeping the pace. So Liz, give them a shout out. Let them know what you sound like. Hi everyone. This is Liz Wilkerson. So, um, yeah. So That's you. What I sound like. Yeah. <laughs> you might hear her um, chime in um, and say, "Hey, hey, slow it, slow it down. You're going too fast." Or um, if you do have a question, she's going to be reading out your questions. Um, so this presentation, if you've gone through any of my presentations, um, I do not like to have you read slides and we are going to break from the slide presentation in just a moment. And we are actually going to show you not screenshots of the application. We're actually going to show you the application and what it looks like so that you could get a good sense of what it is that we're talking about. And that way, if we do have a question, it allows me, you know, you, I can't anticipate your questions. And so if you do have a question and you want to look at or review a, a certain piece of uh, of the functionality or or screen, then that allows me to go do that without having a prepared screenshot. But I do have a couple of slides first. I want to talk about business requirements enablement. So for those of you who are new to Configuration Console and what it is and what it does for you, it allows you to add additional fields and additional screens and additional forms. Um, everything that you see that we'll be talking about, if you see it inside of the application, you can pretty much change it. If you had the desire and you also had the time, the money, and the resources, there's two pieces of um, two pieces of delivered functionality that you could use to totally rewrite and redesign this entire application. Not, I'm not suggesting that you do that, but you could do that. One of those tools is process automation. All of the actions, the business flow behind the scenes that allows you to change um, the process automation cha- allows you to change the delivered functionality. And then the other piece, the um, and that handles like behind the sc- behind the screens logic of approvals and and processing and updating tables and stuff. Um, we're not focusing on process automation today, but uh, process automation often works hand in hand with the configuration console, which allows you to change the visual elements. It also, if you get down into defining some of the actions on the advanced side, it allows you to do some business logic as well. And you'll see that represented um, when we talk about the new web UI and the configuration console tool and how they have that laid out, talking about business logic. Um, The concept of exposing the configuration console or allowing you to use the configuration console is to better support your business requirements. When you're implementing or you're looking at a business process, you should not be restricted by what the what your chosen technology can do for you. It should not drive you into adopting a particular business process or a particular workaround. That's not what should happen. And if you're doing that, you need to take a look at your software. You need to take a look at your business process and say, how can we make this uh, better using configuration console are using process automation. A well-designed software software enables business requirements and does not dictate to you what your business requirements are. Um, the a well-engineered software eliminates burdensome customization, resulting in difficult maintenance. If you're reading the screen, what that means is um, when we t- is that on my next slide. Configuration console utility configure vis- versus um, customize. The things that we're talking about today, if you're from the old world, like I am, I've been dealing with the Lawson slash N4 products for since 1997. Um, We used to have things called user exits, or we used to customize 
uh, screens through Design Studio. Those are true customizations. Or if you're someone who is thinking about and you're joining the call and you're thinking about moving to the N4 products, particularly the Landmark products, and you want to get a good sense of what's possible, typically in other products, you actually have to you customize. You compile a screen or you compile a table, particularly data tables, right? The burden that is very burdensome on your information technology department to maintain those customizations because as those release updates come through, um, those patches, those cumulative updates referred to as CUs, as they come through, you're often uh, required to deploy those customizations. The way that the configuration console utility tool works, it is not a customization tool, and I want to be clear about that. That's not when you set down to implement or you set uh, down to look at a new screen, a new business process, you are not customizing a screen. You are configuring a screen just like you would with anything. You know, there are a lot of fields in the system that uh, that come with the system that you have to populate with the values at your organization. For example, you, I told you that I'm an, uh, an, an, an HCM person by background. We have employee employment statuses like relationship to organization where we define what type of employees that we have in our system whether they're full-time or part-time or seasonal right or whether we track contractors um, that that's one type of configuration but also there may be other configurations that are specific to your organizations where you need a new field that was not delivered or you need a new form that was not delivered or the actions that were delivered that doesn't actually there's some little facet or nuance about the delivered action the way that it works um, that it doesn't work for you so while there is this rule of 60 30 10 meaning that if you are a new client that 60 percent of the delivered functionality should meet your needs without any type of configuration or customization whatsoever 30% of, um, of the application as it is delivered, it, it needs configuration. Those are the fields and the values that you fill in. You, you have the forms, you have the fields, but you need to fill in the blanks, kind of like an ad lib approach, right? Or is it mad lib? A mad lib approach. And then the 10% are the things that is recommended where you have specific business requirements that exist at your organization that you have to configure that it was not it was not there's no way they could deliver that to you right they wouldn't know that you needed these fields for a particular vendor integration on the material side 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 of the world or that you needed um, these fields to make your benefit enrollment process work because you have particular benefit plans to your organization right um, and then I do want to draw draw your attention to the new business tables. You can put new tables inside of your um, of inside of your install installation of your 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 application, your version of or your particular your specific organizational um, application. So if you need a new table to track vendor details or sales information or a table to track information on employees that did not come with the system, you can create that inside of the system. And once again, it doesn't require a DB reorg when you do that. It is stored within the repository. Um, make yourself comfortable with that term. There is a repository that houses all of these configurations. And so when you when the releases do come through, you don't have to redeploy. You don't have to update the, um, those pieces. Uh, it will automatically come along with all of your other data just as if, it, as if it were the items master list or if it were your employee database it's just going to be there once the custom uh or the cumulative updates are applied i'm going to take a deep breath a drink of water and liz if you'll take a look at our chat board and see if there are any questions there are not any questions right now john okay so this is where i'm going to break away uh, from my PowerPoint presentation, and I'm actually going to go into the app, uh, the application. So I'm going to go into N4 Global HR. Once again, I am an HR person by background, so I'm going to focus on that. The thing, even though I am an HR person background, one of the things, if you are implementing 
uh, supply chain management or you're you're implementing um, the the GL portions of the FSM piece, you still have to do uh, the, the HCM portion of this. And if you want more information about that, about how the HCM portion plays off of the financial supply chain management portion, then you can reach out to Brian or to Molly and we can get you more information. The reason for that is, is that it, it is a very well integrated landmark application enterprise resource planning software, meaning that the resources that you see here on the HCM side, they actually feed into the supply chain management people because our employees are your purchasers. They are the uh, shipping clerk um, receivers, right? And so um, you need to uh, set things up over here so you will, even though you may not be HCM specific, you will be focusing on that. All right. So I'm just going to pull up. This is our demo box that we keep live and ready for these types of things. And this is everything that you see on the screen, right? This this search field, um, these employees here, everything is a config. These menus over here, everything is a configurable, uh, a configurable a piece of information and how do I know what it is that I'm configuring? There's a trick that it's called control shift uh, click and that will tell me exactly what element it is that I am looking at that I want to configure. It tells me what business class that I'm looking at. It tells me the form name. It tells me the, uh, the whether it's a field. It tells me the type of field that it is. Um, and down here, for example, if I clicked here, and I hit control shift click. Uh, maybe I clicked a little bit too low. Let me try that again. Right there. It'll tell me that this is a list. A list in this application is anywhere that you see a data view, kind of like an Excel spreadsheet. That's called a list, right? So there's one thing that I want to draw your attention. If there is a configuration to the particular item that you're looking at, like a form or a list or a field, it, there, it, when you do the control shift click piece, it will tell you if it is a configuration. So for example, if there this page was configured, it would actually say configured. Uh, and if you want, and it says no configuration information available, no configuration info, right? And if I wanted to configure this particular list, the, there's a shortcut for that. I'm gonna show you the longer way from the web, web UI here in just a moment um, and getting into that, but and what that looks like, because we're talking about the new web UI versus the old web UI. Um, but if you wanted to just go into there and hit create configuration, just like we would within the rich client, we do have the ability of doing that. So it's going to now go out. Notice my tab up here has changed configuration console. One of the things you're going to notice is, is that my application space has changed. So if I go back here to my other view, close this out, if you don't, if you're not familiar, what's this doing? Oh, there it is. If you're not familiar with the terminology, the actual terminology, these things are called space. We know employee space, manager space, but um, security roles define for us what web applications we have access to. And then when we talk about them in the context of user interface, um, those web services actually are referred to as uh, as as spaces. So this is. Um, the administration console space, the administrator space, and then there's a configuration console space, and you can see that here. So one of the ways that you can get to the new web UI, if you have it enabled, and I'm going to talk to you about it being enabled just in just a moment. So if that's a question, you're like, well, I don't see that. Like, I have wide open security. I don't see that on my menu item. Um, if you're a multi-tenant, you have this behind the scenes, and we'll talk about how um, how and what you should do in order to to enable that if you want if you want to do that okay so I'm going to close this out for just a moment because you saw me how how that's one way that I can get into it but there's also another way that you can get into the configuration console space one is is that you can just go to it once you have it enabled you have the configuration console uh, configuration console space right here right I call it for me um before when you were in the rich client you would go to your start menu item you would go to configure and you would go to application right and it would be a tool i 
am taking the position that with this new release, it's no longer a tool. It is an actual module into itself because not only did they take the pieces of information that you could do where you would configure the application, but now there's additional tools that you see over here within the configuration console space that was not there before. And they, um, there were pieces here and there, but they've pulled it all together and they've wrapped it up into a very nice uh, package. And let me tell you, when I saw that they had this available, I am using it in an international uh, project right now uh, that includes the US, China, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, Mexico, Netherlands, and Romania. And it is great because we're on different time frames and we're on different schedules. And the change management piece that, um, that is now within the new module, the configuration console module, it allows us to take system snapshots of only the pieces that apply to a particular business uh, solution that we're applying to. So like if if I have something that's going on in China and it's affecting the screens that they see in China, um, I can now, inst instead of what I used to have to do is just import out all of the pieces in one fell swoop for all of the configuration consoles. I'm gonna talk about tagging here in just a moment. I can tag the pieces that I want and I can create a snapshot and I can move those over um, without having just to totally re manually rebuild or to do that, okay? So the other thing I wanna move uh, that, that you may um, have a question about because in the rich client, I said that you can go to the start menu, configure application. And if you were also a security administrator that you would have the ability uh, to see that in the rich client. I don't want to cover this today, but I do want to point out that there is also uh, new security administration space. So if I switch over here, this is where I can see the configurations and the security roles and everything that it, uh, uh, and I can user management actors configurations, which would be um, those those custom security classes. There's administration over here. Once again, I don't want to cover that today because we're talking about configuration console. But remember, going back to what I said about they are they being in for it, they have announced on the roadmap that the rich client is being deprecated. So you need to plan on how you're going to move your organization away from the rich client because eventually it will not be supported and, and, and it's not going to work for you. Um, so when we talk about the pieces that have to be put in place, I talked about the payroll module, right? That's the last major piece, the last major uh, module to be ported from the old application S3 world into the, some of you may not be the old loss in S3 world, uh, but that was the last piece before that whole product in itself has been sunsetted. They've already announced that S3 is going away, right? And of course, part of the roadmap is the announcement of the rich client and it going away. And part of that was putting the configuration console tools and the security administration tools out there. So we could we we will start seeing movement on that um, as we go um, through the oncoming months. It's it's not something that we're talking about that is off in the future um, because of the way that we have to plan and test and do these things. Um, these are things that you need to be thinking about today. And if you would like more information about the things that you would like that you need, that how you how do you make this transformation um, uh, to where you need to be? Um, you can reach out to Brian. You can reach out to Molly. You can reach out to me or Liz, and we'll get you. The, to the right person about the information that you need to be considering about how do you do that. Now, the configuration console tool is slated for um, GA release. It is in limited preview release right now. Um, if you are interested in doing this, I would contact your client success manager, your CSM N4, and they can say, yep, you're good to go. Just, you know, we just like to be aware of who's in the product using the tool. Um, but there are security classes that it's easy. You set up a custom, until it is GA, you can set up a security class um, that gives, that provides specific access to both the configuration console web application and the security administration web application, and then put that security, that custom security class within the configuration access underscore ST security class. And then that will automate, you log out, you log back in and the configuration tool, it's going to appear here and you'll, you'll see this right here. 
So let's talk about home. Hey, this John. Is, yes. John, sorry. Yes. Um, we had a question. Could you do you happen to know what the dates are for the sun setting? I don't know of S3 and rich client. Um, I don't know, but we can find that out. I'm going to um oh wow. Is that me? Hold on, I have some I had some feedback. Did you guys hear that or was that just me? Yeah, it was that was you. Oh, that was crazy. That was crazy loud. Um, Liz, um, if we could ping that person back and um ask them to provide a, a name so we can follow back up with them and we'll get them that get get that information back to them. Okay, um, I've got it. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, so I'm looking at the home screen. One of the things that uh, is an improvement versus the rich client, number one, we don't have a menu going down the left-hand side where all of everything that, um, as far as configuration console is related, it's right here in front of us, right? Um, so it tells us, our this is our home board. Um, it tells us the configurations within the last 14 days. It talks about a, re a re remote snapshot. I'm going to talk more about those in just a moment. And it'll talk to us about the invalid uh, configurations, the overridden configurations, which is <laughs> a good uh, is a good thing. Invalid personalizations and personalizations. Let's take a moment to talk about personalizations. I do not like personalizations. I I recall that Liz does not like personalizations either, right, Liz? Is that true? So a personal, uh, I do do them sometimes, but I do take them away once I get what I need. Yeah. So um, a configuration <laughs> is a global change that you make to the screens. A personalization is something. It is it, number one. It requires a security class to be given to users in order to do that. But a personalization is allowing each person to make a change, their own personal changes to a screen. Where they can rearrange fields, they can um, rearrange the columns that are in the the data list. The problem that I have with that, from an information technology standpoint, is they something eventually will they'll call somebody and then they want to call someone in IT to give them support or open up a ticket. Like why why is my screen not doing this or why is it not doing that? And can you imagine having let's just say in my client, um, my international client, and in all of these different countries. Uh, with, you know, tens of thousands of employees and you have uh, just even a small percentage of those saying, um, yeah, why is my screen look the way that it does? Because it doesn't. No, that's just craziness. So I'm not a fan of personalizations, but if you um, did allow personalizations, then you can see um, the personalizations where who, you know, one of the first things that you can say, okay, is there a personalization and they can, and you can see who has personalized their own their own screens and and troubleshoot it that way. Um, the invalid configurations is very helpful to have right in front of you. Every up here, if I go, I don't want to go away from here, but there's a what's new section under the help. So like if you wanted to, let's see if this opens this up. It does. I was if you did not know when the release yes. comes out, the what's new thing, uh, all of the release notes for the cumulative updates, they're actually right here. Um, and so what happens here, and then what, and it also talks about what modules there that, that are affected by that so that you can evaluate those, right? And what happens is, is that some of those may affect the configurations. They're not supposed to, but you may find out that they may. So after every scheduled release update, where you really didn't have great insight as to what might have been affected, or if someone's made other some type of change, then you would have the invalid configurations appearing here, and then you can manage the invalid. So that's great. It's wonderful. This homepage where they brought everything together, I love it. It's great information. Um, however, um, there are some other things here that is that are very useful. This is the replacement for the old configuration console tool. I am going to try my very best to talk as articulately, but as fast as I can to get through the other pieces. I am going to skip the personalization piece today, but I am going to talk about change management and the basic access tools here in just a moment. Um, configuration console tool. Um, this is where we go into the console. And the console is where we 
manage the pieces that are already out there, right? Um, and we can see the LPL that comes up and we can choose uh, the, the different types of configurations that are out there inside of the system. This is where we can create new configuration consoles. And remember I talked about understanding the user interface and the business logic piece because I did say, and I'm going to clean it up a little bit here, um, that the configuration console tool is used for the user interface part of configuring the pieces that you need. So the list, the forms, the card views, the pages, uh, so on. This, these are the existing components. So if you want to change something that was delivered, then you would choose one of these items here. If you wanted to add a new component that did not exist before, then you can change here. Um, the other part is the web application and the menu items. If you wanted to look at those, notice that those are configure only, particularly the menus. I am really waiting for them to uh, allow you to create a brand new menu that does not exist inside of the system. If you're wondering, I want to create a whole brand new menu over here on one, you know, like here in the navigation bar, you can't do that. You can only take an existing menu and hijack it and change it. And it's a little, it's a little bit of a problem in certain circumstances. And so, but you, but it does allow you to uh, configure menus. So this is the user interface piece, but down here at the bottom, and I kind of like that they did this because it wasn't that clear clear before. What is it? What exactly is it that I'm configuring? Am I configuring the user interface or am I configuring the business logic? Like it was always very confusing when you're adding a new field. Like let's just say that you need a new benefit code field of something, a field that does not exist in the system. It actually is a two-step process. One is, is that you have to tailor the business logic of creating the field itself right? You need somewhere to store the data before you add it to a form. And I think that as you are in being initiated into your first experiences with that, the way that they've laid this out and redesigned this, it's much better where we can say, okay, to add new type of business logic, whether it's a field or it's a drive field or a compute field, um, or if it's a new, um, where we're combining two tables where they're not combined like in a relationship. If you're talking about a DBMS system, it's called a relationship here. They've uh, hijacked that and said, create new relations. So a relation is the same way as creating a relationship between two data tables. Uh, if you needed to configure the cubes um, or create brand new actions that exist inside of the table, then it's down here under the business logic and they've separated that out so that you can see that. Um, over here, you can, when you click on the master, you can see all of the master. Um, I like to set this to a higher number. 100. John, I just want to tell you a uh, time check is 1234. Okay. Thank you very much. I am going to uh, move away from this in just a second. And if you wanted to double click here, you can double click um, and look at the particular. Um, you can look at the particular um, configuration here. You can change it. Now, before, you'll notice, uh, if, you, if you've if you used the configuration console to, tool before, you'll notice that there was configure configure option at the top. We don't have that anymore. We actually have what is called an edit button. And I do like, I, this is, I, look, I'm a JavaScript person and I use Visual Studio and I use all, also, one of the things that I like about this is, is that it's auto, see if I can get it to auto complete employee. So um, relationship to, or, well, I can't, but, um, but it will auto complete and tell you what fields and stuff that you are available. Now you will recall that I stated that those of you who use configuration console tool need to become very familiar with loss or la uh, the landmark pattern language. Right. The re let me go back to the master. The reason that I stated that here is. See if I can get to. Something that has a lot of LPL in it. Okay, here. You do not have a graphic user interface any longer when you move to this uh, web UI tool. 
you will need to know how to write the landmark pattern language. Um, there, you know, before when you would go in and you would hit uh, configure and it would give you this nice presentation of where you can mark a checkbox that said this is hidden or there would be a field that says new label. That will not exist when you adopt the new web UI for the configuration console space. You are expected to understand and be able to write pure landmark pattern language. I often get the question, and I know that Liz gets this question too, who owns the configuration console pieces with inside of an application? My answer has always been, if you have some very savvy tech, technology human resources people, that it would be okay to have someone in an HRIS department or a very tech savvy HR su support person in order to do the, um, the development for the configuration console pieces, that would be fine. But now that we are shifting away from the graphic user, uh, the, the GUI, the graphical user interface portion of where you can pull up the form and you can basically just click on the field that you want and then uh, give options as to whether you want to hide it, rename it, change the color, and you actually have to write the landmark pattern language code to make those changes. My opinion now that that places it squarely within the inform and in most circumstances, and I'm going to say, because there are some very tech savvy people that sit in human resources this, these days, um, HR analysts and stuff like that. Um, but I do because of the whole LPL piece, I do think that this falls squarely within the um, IT world and that they own these configuration pieces now because of that. Hey, John, I do have a question. Um, where do they learn LPL? That is a wonderful question because <laughs> I am going to go over. Let's see if. Let me switch over here and I just want to. Okay. Don't want to be there. Where I want to be here is in the LPL viewer. This has always existed within the rich client. You could have always looked at this, right? And this is allows us to pull up a business view, a business view. And I'm going to pull up employee, for example. Maybe I won't do employee today. Maybe I will do vendor because I, I, I always pull up employees, but I want to do vendor today. Okay. A vendor. A business object, this is all of the things that are included in defining a vendor, all of the code that it exists for a vendor. It's here. You can see the list. You can see all of the lists that exist in the side of the system. You can see all of the forms that exist inside of the system. You can see all of the pages, the menus, the web applications, and the type of fields. For um, and so if you're if you're looking at what type of fields exist and what the LPL code is, let me see if I can pull up employee here. Okay, there's badge employee. That's a, that's a field, and here's employee. This is what defines an employee. Okay, that is the LPL code. And I'm going to go over to this, and I know there's LRC detail. I think that is a form. Okay, this is the main view for the for the resource. In time, you will be able to, as you look and you configure things inside of the system, you will gain the experience. But one of the best ways that you can learn the LPL is take a delivered form. You can do the control shift click, figure out what form that is, and then you you will still have to familiarize yourself with the LPL and say, ah, I see here how this is written. So, for example, if you're like, what gives it, why is it laid out that way um, as far as the birth date, the start date, right? What type of field? You can go into the LPL viewer that, that is there. Now, that's my non-sales pitch. If you are self uh if you want to take the self initiative to do that, you want to go in the system and learn that. 
if you would like a class in LPL and uh, exploring the LPL topics, then I'm going to ask that you leave your name in the chat window or that you reach out to Brian Waters or Molly. I Not to do the sales pitch, I'm not, not here to do Brian's job for him, right? But uh, reach out to them and we will talk to you about delivering you LPL training so that you can learn LPL. It's one of those things that you will need someone with experience um, to bring that knowledge to you because it's not something at this moment that N4 is supplying, but we definitely can work with you to give you that knowledge. Okay. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Any other class, uh, any other topics before I have to move on? No. Okay. So let's talk about man managed changes. So I've made all of these um, configurations that are in the system, right? And I need to, um, I need, first of all, if you are changing forms, adding things to the system, removing things from the system, you better have the technical documentation behind it. And so you need to have the screenshots. Where should this form, uh, how should this form be modified? Why, what's the business reason as ha having that modified? That's just good change management pra uh, practice, right? And so what those usually are tagged with are a business specification number so that IT can track those. Um, in fact, this is a SOC requirement where you have authorized testing in the approval process. So if you are um, interested in SOC 1, SOC 2 kind of controls from an IT perspective, you actually have to have that type of documentation. And so one of the things that um, we are encouraging people to do, let me go actually back up here to the master. Um, and is to tag their items with the business specification. So I can actually tag this. Um, there's a tag item, and that allows me to put the business specification number. So I can say business specification number 34 or 345, right? And then I can hit submit. And that tag that item with 345. And when I go back over to the change management process, um, I can manage changes and it'll give me my tags. On that, when I pull up uh, BS35, it'll give me all of C, it'll give me all of the different configurations in the system that I've tagged with that. And the way that I, what, how I use those tags is, is that I create a bundle. So once that's there, or actually over here, um, I can create a bundle and then I export the bundle out with all of the configuration consoles and I create a snapshot. So I have local snapshots and I have remote snapshots, right? A local snapshot is something that I just made. Like if I wanted to do a local snapshot of tag 345, it would tag, it will create a snapshot of those configuration console items right then and there. And then I export those out and I bring them into my other production environment. Cause typically we would see you do this in test and then you would promote after the testing is approved and done and authorized to move to production, you would bring it into the system and you would have remote snapshots. And then you validate the remote snapshot, make sure that it's clean, and then you hit the applied snapshots so that you will be able to, at any given time, see all of the changes that you made, who, when they made, what pieces were involved in that. The change management part of that, of this new uh, space is absolutely great. I love it and it's worked wonders for us in a very dynamic uh, international um, application setting, okay? Any questions on change? Well, the other thing I wanna talk about uh, quickly is that when I create the bundles, I can actually send that for approval so um, the people who write the configurations and they ultimately say, yeah, I feel that this is good to go, they can actually send that bundle probably over to an IT manager or to an HRIS director or something like that. And that person can review the attached documentation, the business specification, the technical specification that you can attach to the request approval. And they can say, yep, I agree that it's good to go and they can approve off on that and it would be marked. And then that's when you do the export and the whole change management process. So this piece right here, love it, it's great. Okay, any questions before I move on? Because I said that I wanted to talk about uh, reports as a web service. No questions, time check is 1245. And um, you were also going to discuss how to enable configuration console. 
Okay, so I did mention that briefly, but let me just um, talk about that a little bit more. So I can go over to the security administration piece for that. And let's talk about the configurations. Let's go to master. And we should be able to see how I did that. Let me search for it just a moment. Okay, so here, did I do that? I did do this. I just don't remember that I called it that. So here I created on the security side, I created a custom security class. And when I go into that custom security class, um, you will be able to see that I added uh, access to the web services, the administrator console, the web apps. Um, I added a, um, I added the necessary code. Once again, you're going to have to do the LPL code to give specific asset access to the configuration console web application as well as as well as the security uh, configuration web app access. And then once you've created your custom security class, then you can go and you can add that custom security class. You can either create a brand new role um, to give someone access to that, or you can. Um, you can add that on to the, it's not breaking the rule with the standard templates because you're not modifying or changing what is delivered. You're just adding to, which is allowed to that. You can add it to the configuration console access uh, class. If you just want to, uh, if you sure, if you're sure that you want to give it to everyone who already has access to that. So I am now going to, um, move away from that for time's sake so that I can get to this next piece. Okay. Everything that you see in this screen, and I just had this conversation with a hospital system who wants to do some deep integration with a third party talent acquisition provider uh, where they want to allow people to apply uh, to pull the jobs out of the system on the talent acquisition side and allow people to apply through a third party product. And I was exploring with them how they would do that. Everything that you see, this form, these screens, everything in the system, it actually is exposed via web services. One of the things that Infor wanted to do is to make sure that their applications were HTML5 compliant and browser agnostic, meaning that um, anyone can use whatever browser, whatever they wanted to use in order to access um, the underlying forms, field screens, data, and so on. And one of the ways that they've done that is that they have partnered with Swagger and so they, so Swagger is an integrated um, tool, let's call it a tool, that you can access the, the web services API. So all of the business classes that we are aware of, you can actually get to via going to here. And when I click on that, ah, look, all these are the names that you are familiar with. So um, job posting, employee, bank code, everything that is a data table, you can actually use a web service in order to get access to that. But what's interesting about Swagger, the way that it works down here where it says reports as a service, it actually allows you to create reports. How would I create a report? I can come up here. Um, and I can, let's see, let me go to, um, let me switch over to employee. I'm not employee. I'm an administrator. Sorry about that. I am moving fast. My brain's all over. It's clicking left and right over here. Um, so if I go over to resources and I want to say, yeah, I like the way that the resources are, and I want to create a report off of that. I can create a report off of that, right? Um, so I can come up here and options, create report. I don't know if you've ever done that inside of the inside of the system, but this is this allows me to add different fields. So if I want to add additional fields that weren't on that listing, I could do that. I could search for that and do that. Well, anyways, when I create that report, um, let me go back home back to GHR, my reports actually show here, up here, the, the reports that I have defined in the system 
they actually show here time to field requisitions and so on. These are all of my reports, reports that are on. I can also create reports and add them to other people. But once I do that, see that time to field requisition, the report is right here. So if I wanted to expose, for example, new hires to an award company or to a benefit vendor so that they particularly like a 401k vendor, then I can expose those people via, a, I can expose that report in a very secure way without sending it through email and exposing PII information and things of that nature. I can give them this link right here that is exposed. Uh, actually, where is it that, um, it is, there's a link that you can, ex oh, try it out. This is what I'm looking for. Execute. Okay, I give this to the 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 benefit vendor, and there they can pull that. Now there's there's a user ID and password that you would give that benefit vendor from a secured standpoint. But when you do that, you would set them up to have very just limited access to let's say this one report, and then they can report that they can pull that report anytime that they want. So that is called reports as a service, and. Once again, once you create your reports over here, it automatically creates a dynamic web service that can be accessed in a very secure way um, via a, and with that call. Once they pull that into a web browser or to another piece of information, then it would automatically give them the access to the data that they wanted to know. Um, there were a lot of people, that was one of the topics that came up. They want, people wanted to say, is that a possibility? What does that look like? How would that work? And I just wanted to make sure that I took the opportunity within this space because it is considered um, a configuration of sorts to talk about that uh, reports as a service. That is definitely a piece of information that is embedded with uh, and delivered with the technology. Okay, I got through all of my topics. I told you that I was going to talk really fast. We did <laughs> record this. And so it is, um, I am surprised once again that I got through without cussing or, or screaming or anything like that. Those of you who have gone through my presentations before, you know that's probably a, a, a big ask of me, um, but I did. So I'm going to take a moment to uh, take a breath and just browse who's out there, see if who is, see if there are any questions. Um, do we have any? We don't have any questions in the chat. But okay. if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again. If there are no questions, then Liz, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to go back to my slide presentation, and I'm going to ask that you, who's wrapping us up? Who's talking I can, about? I can, I can wrap up, John. Okay, so let's let's wrap this up and put a bow on it and let people enjoy their Friday afternoon. Well, John, great job, Liz. Thanks for the help and uh, thanks for all who attended yeah. today. If you enjoyed today's webinar, we hope you'll consider attending our next one uh, scheduled for uh, June 25th. We'll be reports, lists, and cues to manage their supply chain and then a beginner's guide to IPAs. John, do you have one more slide there regarding I coffee actually, with consultants? Yeah, I have that. We have the June the 18th, which was this one. And then, yes, I think this is my last slide. Okay, so as a closing thought, we wanted to make you aware of our Coffee with Consulting offering. If you have any questions about what you saw today or any questions related to the info products, please reach out to us via our website. We will connect you with a consultant who will spend a half hour with you at no charge. Again, thank you for your time today, and we look to, to meeting with you again. Thanks, all. Yeah, I'm going to point out, I'm going to point out Molly's uh, email down at the bottom, molly.velasco. Brian Waters is on the call. All of our emails are brian.waters at bellsllc.com. Same way with Liz, myself. If you have questions, let us know. Thank you very much. We'll talk to you down the road. Bye. Nice job. Thank you. Thank you, John. Great Thank time. you, John. Thank you all. Thanks, John.